we are going to uh, talk about the uh, interdiscipline uh, research today somehow. Okay. I think about this topic. I think that's very important. Good. Because if you uh, go back to the Greece, and mm. actually you will find out that the when you talk about the philosophy, actually you can see there's science in it. Yes. And the discipline is of the uh, study is not very clear. Yes. Because that when you talk about philosophy, it may include the science and other important things yes. inside the study. Yes. Well, uh, at the uh, lowest level, mm -hmm. the job of a lawyer is to simply uh, apply the law to particular circumstances. Yep. And a, in a way that's not very difficult. You have to mm -hmm. you have to just know what the law says in the description mm -hmm. uh, in the law itself mm -hmm. and an understanding of the ordinary meaning of words is enough to apply mm -hmm. the law in most circumstances. But the most important legal questions, mm -hmm. questions with the greatest significance mm -hmm. uh, are not of that kind. Mm -hmm. They involve much more questions of the policy Mm -hmm. uh, that the state, uh, a group of people, mm -hmm. wish to pursue. Mm -hmm. So the highest levels mm -hmm. of uh, the practice of the law mm -hmm. involve the creation of law, the mm -hmm. making of law, mm -hmm. especially through its interpretation. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the making of law or the creation of law, we need to know what the consequences are going to be. Mm -hmm. And to know what the consequences are going to be, we need social science. We need yep. economics, we need political science, we need sociology, we need psychology. So I think at the highest level of practice in the law, these interdisciplinary concerns uh, are immediately important. Yeah, but still we can see that I, uh, I appreciate that we can try to, today we are, somehow we agree, try to put other disciplines, yeah. like uh, the, uh, economics of course, yeah. psychology and physiology and yeah. other fields, right. the study methodology into the legal study. Right. But we can see another way that developing about the law because uh, in the, no matter in civil law or the common law system, sometimes you can find out that the lawyers, the judges, got their own speci uh, special language. That's right. And they are somehow trying to build a system that somehow separate, independent from uh, other part of the academics field, different fields. And when they talk about their specified field as lawyers, not just got their own jargons, but also uh, based on their own uh, theory, they build up a specified stru structure that are quite independent. And this somehow based on the history maybe sometimes even some coincidence that if you in the common law system maybe because that case go just to this lawyer or or, uh, or go to this judge and the judge got his own opinion and it become a president and in the civil law system maybe some people just want to make that law and maybe because from the um, uh, the people inside the government they got a very specified idea, and at that specified specify time, that it become a law. Yes. And well, I, I think it's it's correct that the law has its own specialized language yep. and its own specialized concepts. Mm -hmm. and, but it's still the case that the specialized language of the law, the specialized concepts, these things have to be interpreted. Mm -hmm. Uh, the law is not self-interpreting. Mm -hmm. uh, when you study law, you don't just memorize rules, you learn how to reason. Exactly. You learn how to reason within the legal tradition. Yep. And I think that uh, social science has a place, and an increasingly large place, in legal reasoning. Mm -hmm. So, uh, let's let me give you an example. Okay, good. Uh, in the uh, 
American constitutional law, mm -hmm. one of the important questions has to do with coercion. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be coerced? Mm -hmm. um, in particular, in our federal system, the federal government sh should not coerce the state governments in many ways. Mm -hmm. Many ways coercion is not, mm -hmm. not allowed under the Constitution. Mm -hmm. um, but to say exactly what is coercion and what is not is very difficult. And in order to say what is coercion and what is not, you need an account of what the consequences will be of one interpretation as opposed to another. So, for example, um, the uh, this has come up very much with the current controversies in America over the Trump administration, mm -hmm. administration of President Trump. Uh, because he wants to get the states to do things that the states don't want to do. Uh, for example, uh, he wants the states to enforce immigration policies in the federal government that mm -hmm. the states don't, some of the states don't want to enforce. Mm -hmm. And the question is, in what ways can he put pressure on the states mm -hmm. to enforce these immigration policies, and in what ways can he not? Mm -hmm. If he can't put pressure in a certain way, then that's said to be coercion. Mm -hmm. The federal government can't coerce the states to carry out federal programs. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if the, if the uh, courts say that a certain kind of pressure mm -hmm. from the federal government on the state is allowed, then they say it's not coercion. It's, it's something else. It's an incentive, but it's not coercion. coercion. How about he try to use the funding? Pardon me? Funding. Yes. Well, that, this is, this is an, 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 an example. Let me give you, <coughs> let's be precise about it. Um, the, there are many federal subsidies that are paid to the states. Mm -hmm. And one thing that the federal government might do mm -hmm. is to say to the states, we're not going to give you money for these other activities like, say, for your roads mm -hmm. or for your schools, mm -hmm. uh, for research. <coughs> we're not going to give you money for any of those other things unless you enforce the immigration policies. And that's probably not allowed in, in America. Mm -hmm. Probably that, that would be considered coercive to tie, say, aid to transportation to enforcing immigration policies because there is a constitutional doctrine about relatedness mm -hmm. that one kind of expenditure has to be related to another before you can condition the federal subsidy uh, uh, for one area on something another area of activity mm -hmm. so the notion of related expenditures is part of the way we explain what it would mean to be unconstitutionally coercing the states. But I think economics has a lot to say about what counts as coercion and what does not. Mm -hmm. It's, um, you know, in one of the characteristics of the economic con concept of efficiency is that the most, the simplest and most fundamental notion of consistency, of, excuse me, of efficiency, mm -hmm. is Pareto efficiency. Oh, right? yeah. And Pareto efficiency means that no one's coerced. Everyone is made better off yeah, or not exactly. worse off. That's different from the uh, Caldor Hicks. It's different from the Caldor Hicks, where someone might be coerced because they're, yep. they're made absolutely worse off. So the idea of uh, Pareto improvement um, is quite useful in mm -hmm. understanding whether coercion is occurring or not. But here is a question. Yeah. Uh, when we talk about efficiency, these are two different standards. We can see that, maybe we can talk more about the detail that was the difference between this one. Yeah. And we can see that the Pareto want everybody to agree. Right. The change. And um, at least no one get worse off. Right. But the Cardo Hicks might get somebody in a worse con uh, condition right. or position. But right. if the p uh, people gain some right. benefit from it, 
and the benefit fish uh, benefit is larger than the loss from right. other person, then right. that's okay. Right. So that's the cattle hick standard. Right. But we can see the cattle uh, hicks is more efficient if you from the economic perspective. So here's the question: When will you try to use the Parato? When will yes. you try to use the cattle hicks standard? Yes. Yes. <coughs> well, uh, what I would say is this: that mm -hmm. if you're if a federal program mm -hmm. is a Pareto improvement, mm -hmm. that means no state is made worse off, mm -hmm. then I would say that no state is being coerced to participate in the program. Mm -hmm. But if, there, if mm -hmm. there's a federal program that's a Calder Hicks mm -hmm. improvement, that means that some states may be worse off mm -hmm. as a result of having that subsidy program. Mm -hmm. In those states that are worse off as a consequence of having the subsidy program, uh, would not participate in it voluntarily. Mm -hmm. They only they have to be coerced to participate in it. Mm -hmm. So as a consequence, the economic notion of efficiency, mm -hmm. distinguished into Pareto efficiency and mm -hmm. Calder Hicks efficiency, mm -hmm. is quite useful in understanding mm -hmm. what it means for the federal government to coerce the state governments. Mm -hmm. So you see, coercion is a legal concept here. Mm -hmm. It's a technical term in the law. A term of constitutional law mm -hmm. that um, you couldn't, you can't tell just from understanding mm -hmm. the use of the word coercion mm -hmm. what the law, the constitutional law of coercion is. It's much more technical. You have to study law to understand it. Yeah, that's a but if you study e if you study economics, it really helps. It really helps you to understand what coercion is in the law because mm -hmm. you see right away. Oh yes, there's going to be a difference between Pareto in a Pareto improvement and a Caldor Hicks improvement because Pareto is not coercive and Caldor Hicks is coercive. Um, then we open these uh, two standards and we got additional question to ask. We can think about that when we talk about the redistribution, that's a very right. important part, not just in law, also in economics. Right. When you try to do redistribution, it might not be the Pareto standard. That's right because then sometimes you cannot get the rich people to agree That's right. to give something to the poor. That's right. So if we try to apply the Pareto standard, and it might be very difficult for us to do the uh, redistribution in the legal theory. Well, that, that's right. Uh, how I would, the way I would put it is this, I put it this way, that the, the Pareto standard is very useful in understanding what counts as coercion in a federal program of subsidizing the states. Mm -hmm. As the federal government subsidizes the states, it puts conditions on the subsidies. Mm -hmm. When are those conditions coercive and when are they not coercive? Pareto notion is very helpful in understanding that question. Mm -hmm. However, the Pareto notion is not useful in understanding uh, the justification for taxation, mm -hmm. because taxation definitely makes people worse off. I mean, mm -hmm. everyone would rather not pay taxes than pay taxes. <laughs> so, and it also has social costs because it's dead weight loss. That's true. It is also a dead weight loss. That's right. So, I think that we have to analyze um, taxation with um, a Calder Hicks framework, not with a Pareto framework. Because we're definitely going to make people worse off from whom taxes are collected. Uh, they'll be worse off for having to pay their taxes. Mm -hmm. And some people will be better off for having received subsidies from the money that's collected mm -hmm. from other people. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. Now, economics does not have a definite mm -hmm. commitment to a particular ethical understanding mm -hmm. of redistribution, right? We, we know that the, the, the economists can be conservative people who don't like redistribution, don't want much of it, or they can be left liberal people who mm -hmm. like a lot of distribution. And they can still be they can still be economists. You're not mm -hmm. compelled because you're economist to be Because that's other. quite normative. Yeah, it's we that's right. We'd say the Normative commitment is outside of the science. It's not, yep. not inside the science. Science is tell you what it is. Yeah, Somehow. 
Yeah, but I think uh, that you can have, I think that the idea that science doesn't necessarily involve a commitment to values isn't correct either. Mm -hmm. And let me explain why. Mm -hmm. You see, if you talk about physics, mm -hmm. you, know, you talk about electrons and protons and neutrons yep. and these particles and the forces, and mm -hmm. there's no ethics in that. Yeah, it's just it's particles. Physics. It's just physics. physics. But if you talk about medicine, it's different. Mm -hmm. Because the whole purpose of medicine is health. Mm -hmm. And health is a value. Mm -hmm. Health is something we, we, we desire, we try to achieve. Mm -hmm. So the idea of medical science is a normative idea. Mm -hmm. It's an idea of health. Mm -hmm. Well, economics is more like medicine than it is like physics. Mm -hmm. Because within economics itself is the idea that it's good to have money. Mm -hmm. It's good to have more opportunities, more wealth, mm -hmm. to be able to buy more things. Mm -hmm. That's good. Mm -hmm. So economics is about making us wealthier, mm -hmm. just like medicine is about making us healthier. Oh, so you mean even if we go to the ultimate purpose of some field like the medicine, and economic, they got some something built inside, building component that that's somehow normative. Absolutely, and the people the people who think that um, economics is like physics, I think are just confused. It's not so. It's always been about wealth. Mm -hmm. Wealth is a value. And economics is a, is mostly about increasing our wealth. You can see that if my memory is right, uh, uh, Richard Posner think that the maximization of the wealth is uh, somehow is a very important standard in law and economics. Yeah. So, but there's that's right. also a question there when when we talk about the wealth, normally we can put a simple way that somehow it's about money, but we can also see another very important standard in the utility. Mm -hmm. Why sometimes people mention the maximization of the wealth? But sometimes we also talk about the maximization of the utility. Yeah. So when we choose between this, because earlier I asked a question that uh, we choose between the two standards, uh, the Pareto and the Cardo Higgs. Yeah. And now we got another question, uh, when would you yeah. use the wealth standard or the utility, even you want to ma uh, do the uh, maximization about it? <coughs> There's a... Uh there's an old joke in which the uh, young person who's uh, trying to get rich is asked uh, why he cares so much about money. Mm -hmm. And he answers, I do, not, I do not care about money. I care mm -hmm. about the things that I can buy with money. Mm -hmm. Now, to care about money in itself mm -hmm. is uh, a perversion. It's a strange perversion. Mm -hmm. we, money is an instrument. It's an instrument. Yeah, it's a tool. It's a tool. And then to get things that are to get things that are intrinsically valuable, money is not intrinsically valuable. It's instrumentally valuable. Mm -hmm. um, so when we talk about the economy, the purpose of wealth, the purpose of mm -hmm. trying to make more wealth, which is what economics is mostly about, mm -hmm. um, sometimes we want to talk about the intrinsic value. Mm -hmm. of it's being created by the things that we buy with the wealth. What do you mean by intrinsic value? Well, what I mean is this. Um, in the case, uh, something can be valuable as an instrument or valuable in itself. Mm -hmm. And most things have a combination of the two. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, uh, someone is whistling a song. Mm -hmm whistle, 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 they're whistling a song. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, why are you whistling the song? And you might say, well, it's intrinsically pleasurable to whistle the song. It feels good to whistle the song. Mm -hmm. So you might say that. In that, in that case, mm -hmm. you're giving an intrinsic reason mm -hmm. why you're whistling. But you might say, well, it's because I, I, I'm unhappy today and I'm trying to cheer myself up. I'm trying to make myself mm -hmm. cheerful. Well, that's an instrumental reason. Well, what you're saying is that you're using the whistling to try to mm -hmm. change the feelings that you're having. Mm -hmm. So when you whistle, 
is it instrumental or is it intrinsic? Well, usually it's some mixture of the two. Yeah. On the one hand, you uh, it's making you happy. You want to make yourself happy, but also it's expressing your happiness in a way that's pleasurable in itself. So 